everyone and welcome to today's session. Um, my name is um, Philippa and I'm the chair of Dyslexia London. Um, we're really excited today to have Willorna Brock, um, an HR consultant and spe specialist with us today. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, I just wanted to let you know a few things before we start and to also introduce Willorna. Um, Firstly, the webinar is being recorded. So if you don't catch everything as we go along, um, you will be sent a link a, a couple of days after and um, you'll be able to see the video, I think Monday, and also the slides will be available. So we'll send those across to you as well. So um, you don't need to worry about catching everything throughout the webinar. Um, we would really love to hear from you for your questions. So as you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna, uh, well, Lorna's gonna speak for um, up to half an hour and then we'll do a Q&A afterwards. So uh, as you think of them, pop them in the Q&A and at the end, we can answer as many questions as we can for you. So for those of you just joining us, welcome. Um, as I just mentioned, the slides and recording will be available at the end. Um, we have Wilona Brock here and she is a qualified teacher and HR professional. Um, she's got experience in the public and private sector and not-for-profit sectors. And she also holds a degree in, uh, a master's degree in human resource management and is a chartered member of the Chartered Institute of Professional Development. Um, Wilona works with small companies, helping them with their, their HR and larger organizations. And she also offers coaching to people looking to change roles. I mean, in, in the time that we're in, it's something that quite a few people are looking at at the moment. She's also written a book and um, it's called Job Hunting, Myths, Secrets and Truths. Um, all of these links are found on the landing page, which we will send to you after the webinar. So, um, Really, thank you so much, Wilona, um, for joining us today. And um, I can pass it across to you to talk about what you're, you're going to be speaking to us about today. Thank you, Philippa, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm really honoured and very delighted to be here to be talking about this. I know that um, people normally have concerns about, you know, any sort of um, issues that they might have at work. So I'm glad to be able to share the knowledge I have about this topic. I also know bits about this from being a teacher in school where um, I had to ensure that it's a teacher's duty to ensure that all lessons and education is accessible to their students. So students with dyslexia have to have their sort of under special needs register and the teacher when Ofsted comes in will make to want to um, inspect the school and make sure that they are actually um, supporting these students. So it's again, it's the same in the work environment as well that you're supposed to have these sort of support from your employer. So we're going to go through quite a jam-packed agenda. Um, look at the strengths of having dyslexia, look at some people who are some famous people successful in their fields who have managed to overcome the, the condition and it did quite well, are still doing quite well. Then I'm going to looking at the legal standpoint, looking at your rights at work and what your employer can do to support you. I'll also look at different stages in, in the work employment life cycle and what you can do at each stage. Um, give examples of what it means to be a positive employer. We'll touch on dealing with change, um, obviously, especially right now, um, the situation we're all in. Um, it's important to know how to handle change. And then I have some useful sources of information that we can share at the end. And of course, your Q&As, um, as you put them in the chat or in the Q&A, Philippa will go through that with us and we'll have a discussion as well. So feel free to ask any question that you want to ask. And if I don't know the answer, I will always try and signpost you to the information. So to start with, um, sorry, what are the strengths of having dyslexia? So I know that sometimes people feel a bit anxious when they have a particular condition that they feel is affecting them. Um, so it's always good to look at the positive. So I've put down some examples of, you know, how 
useful it is actually to some positives in having dyslexia. So dyslexia, um, people with dyslexia tend to be highly creative, lots of actors and artists, can see the bigger picture, can see things more holistically, great pattern skills, be able to see how things connect to form complex systems, um, great pattern recognition, identify similarities among multiple things. And it's also quite useful, you find a lot of dyslexics in the fields like science and maths, where visual representations are key. So um, examples of people who have um, dyslexia, if you look at Pablo Picasso, apparently the artist Pablo Picasso was described by his teachers as having difficulty differentiating the orientation of letters. He painted his subjects as he saw them, sometimes out of order, backwards. If you've seen any of his um, paintings, you would know this, backwards and upside down. But his paintings also demonstrated the power of recognition and imagination, which perhaps was linked to the inability to see written words properly. So there we go, quite a lot of positives there. And this is um, a quote from a world-renowned radiologist and an expert in ultrasound. She says she realized that she had dyslexia and then realized that this, she had this gift for imaging, living in a world of patterns and images and seeing things that no one else sees. Because of dyslexia, I can see these patterns. You can't overcome it, but you can work around it and make it work for you, but it never goes the way. That's probably a good thing because if dyslexia went away, then the other gifts would go away too. So it's always useful to think about the positives. A selection of people who, famous people who have dyslexia, you may recognize some of them. Jimmy Oliver, I never actually realized that um, he suffered from dyslexia. George Washington, a famous US president. Agatha Christie, the writer. Um, F. Scott Fitzgerald as well. So now let's go on to the legal standpoint, because as we all know, at work, in the work environment, we're protected by various pieces of legislation, employment law, employment legislation, the Equality Act. So um, it's a disability. Disability is a protected characteristic under the Equality Act 2010. So it means that any sort of discrimination, harassment, or victimization at work is unlawful. And a disability is a physical or mental impairment. So it's not just about a physical disability. It's a physical or mental impairment. And the impairment has a substantial and long-term effect on someone's ability to carry out their day-to-day -day activities. And some of these the characteristics of dyslexia lend to some of these problems for people at work. It's complex more than just reading and writing. It includes difficulties with organization, memory, word retrieval, and speed of processing, and is definitely likely to satisfy the criteria of having a substantial effect on somebody's individual ability to carry out their normal day-to-day -day activities. So having worked in HR in different sectors and different organizations, I have had to support employees who had dyslexia. I had to help the employer. We had to make reasonable adjustments to support them at work. So your rights at work. Your employer has a duty of care, a legal responsibility to make reasonable adjustments, to help you to work effectively, and to minimize any adverse effects that might impact on your ability to perform. And apart from a legal right, it's also ethical for an employer to ensure that people are able to carry out their duties at work. It's, it's sort of a strong moral compact. You want to help people. So that means that they should have appropriate policies and processes in place to avoid discrimination, including in the recruitment process, the work environment, and colleague reactions, as in your line manager, your colleagues, how supportive are, are, are they to help you at work. And failure to do this and actually give rise to a claim for disability discrimination. So it is quite serious stuff. But of course, there's a caveat that 
we always would need to seek legal advice on individual scenarios, individual circumstances. A landmark case is a Starbucks case, and that made people realize how important it is to support their employees at work. So in the Employment Tribunal, this case took place in 2016, where the employee was found to have been discriminated against because she had dyslexia. Because she recorded um, inadvertently, took the wrong, recorded the wrong temperature of the fridge, water at specific times, she had a roster where she had to enter all these results. She made mistakes as a result of her condition. And because of that, they gave her quite a difficult time. Her managers removed certain duties from her and she was told to retrain. Um, that caused her a lot of distress, leading her to even feel suicidal. So she took her employers to a tribunal and the tribunal found that Starbucks had failed to make reasonable adjustments that work for her disability and the effect, and that was as a result of her having dyslexia. So it is, that case was actually quite um, popular at the time because everyone woke up to the idea that they really needed to support their employees. I mean, there's, there's damage to an employer, reputational damage, um, if you know their names out there as having been taken to a tribunal. So it's in everyone's best interest to support their employees to avoid these type of scenarios. So what are reasonable adjustments? Um, reasonable adjustments is what the employer will do to support your work, the sort of amendments and things that they will do to make the work environment conducive for you. But you have to make sure that your employer is aware of the condition. If this um, is undiagnosed or you have no knowledge of the condition or your employer doesn't know about it, they're not going to be able to support you and you won't be able to say, you know, they haven't supported you because they didn't really know about it in the first place. And reasonable adjustments include several things like um, how practical they are for the employer to take, to take those steps your individual condition, etc. So it's always useful to have, to seek the, um, some advice. So what are reasonable adjustments? There's changes, small or large, depending on your circumstances, the role and the environment. They should be reasonable, meaning that they should not really lead the employer to have to change the essential requirements of the role or cause huge financial strain on them because if, for example, it's a SME, it's a small business, they may not be able to afford to make those adjustments. And of course, they're based on your individual needs. So it's always wise to seek specialist advice from occupational health, legal advice, or at the end of the, at the talk, I will be sharing um, some details of organizations that can carry out assessments and advise you on how these reasonable adjustments can be made at work. So some examples of reasonable adjustments, it could be the environment. So the desk could be placed in an area that is likely to provide minimum um, distractions, a, a fixed desk location as opposed to hot desking, which I guess could be a challenge right now because we're all kind of working virtually. Um, providing written back backups such as an email for verbal information or instructions, providing explicit feedback on work completed, providing a, a colleague to proof your documents for you, relaying instructions verbally as opposed to in writing, allowing people to record instructions or meetings instead of writing things down, and that can be done by providing a dictaphone or digital recording device. You can speak to your line manager and alter your performance targets, perhaps giving you longer time to complete tasks, um, and also agreeing changes to your duties or your working hours. So don't be, and also it's really an individual thing. So have that, try to have that confidence to speak openly with your line manager and talk about what really works for you as well and come to a sort of mutually, mutually acceptable agreement. So looking at the different stages at the, in the employment life cycle, where you can, um, what you can do and what sort of support you can get. So for example, when applying for a role, um, I would like to give a piece of advice here. So when you look at the job description, you look at the advert, 
you do your research about the company, try and be realistic and pragmatic as to whether that role would suit you, whether the culture of that organization perhaps would suit you. And then once you've decided that it all looks good and um, you need support, you need to let them know that you have dyslexia and you need some support. So for example, if you have tests to complete on the day, you can ask for some extra time. At the interview, you could ask them to repeat things. Be very, very open because um, some employers are really good on the advert or, or at the interview. Once you're invited to interview, they will ask you whether there are any sort of adjustments that they need to make for you um, on the interview day. And then once you're successful, you start work, let your, know, your manager know from the start in terms of doing your induction, your onboarding. And then um, that's a really good time for you to complete those assessments to, um, to see how the work environment can be adapted for you. And then when it comes to managing your performance, setting your target, negotiate deadlines, and that sort of thing. So I remember if I go back to even education, in education in school, some students were given extra time during the exams um, because of their dyslexia. So it's the same thing if you have a test on the day as part of the assessment, you should be able to ask for that as well. And again, about recruitment, the Equality Act also protects job applicants. So although you don't have any obligation, it's personal for you to disclose your disability, um, but it is helpful for people to, to let their employers, the prospective employers know. But they are not really permitted to ask you about any sort of disability or health until you've been offered the job but if they feel that you need you might they want to help you during the recruitment process they're well within their rights to ask whether any sort of reasonable adjustments are needed during the recruitment process and also we have to be realistic whether your condition will allow you to carry out the main part of the role because the employer has a job to fulfill. They've set up their company, their organization. They have their goals. They need to get the right people to do those jobs. So let's be realistic and pragmatic as to whether you are really going to be able to do that job. Again, looking at the work environment, a very open and inclusive culture. I mean, most employers are moving towards that right now. Most employers are trying to be inclusive trying to have equal opportunities, trying to accommodate people because they realize that people are indeed the heart of all organizations. Without your people, you can't really achieve anything. So they have policies and processes that do not sort of inadvertently discriminate against certain groups of people. They encourage line managers to, to be supportive. They encourage colleagues as well to be supportive. We're talking about the situation that we are now where we are working virtually, there's talk about, you know, checking in, regular check-ins with people, regular support, making sure that everyone's okay. Next week is Mental Health Awareness Week. It's all about kindness. It's the theme this year. So, again, this is not just for one week. This is how we really, as human beings, really, to be supporting each other. So, what makes a positive employer? So, a positive employer is someone that would focus on your ability to do the job rather than your health or disability. And they have a strong commitment to equal opportunities. And there are quite a lot of schemes out there as well to support organizations. Um, so there's the government's disability confidence scheme. It's the kind of sign that you will see on an employer's website or on their head, um, letterhead. Um, it's basically a scheme that supports employers to make the most of the talents that people have, um, disabled people can bring to their workplace. There's also Business Disability Forum, which is a membership organization that links businesses, disabled people, and the government. So dealing with change, um, what happens once you've started your job? What happens once you've had that conversation? Um, realize that you're going to have to have some sort of assessment, some tests, and then you're going to have to wait for those tests and things to come back, a report perhaps from one of the organizations on recommendations. Implementing some of these adjustments will take time, depending on the nature of your dyslexia, the job role, and the environment. So it's always best to allow yourself time to see those improvements. It's always best to just keep that communication going, 
if things are taking too long, follow up and find out what's happening. Don't be afraid to, to open up and, and express how you're feeling about it, but just sort of be pragmatic and realistic about timelines. Give yourself time. And then um, there's some useful sources of information here. There's a company called just Clear Talents, and they specialize in assessment for dyslexia to see what sort of equipment that you might need at work. There's also hands-free computing, and then access to work is a government-funded scheme that helps employers to support their employees with any sort of equipment that they need to help them at work. So I hope that's been helpful. Um, we've come to the end. Um, Philippa, do you have any questions? From yeah, the so, so no, thank you so much, Willona. That's great. Um, do keep them coming, the questions. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start to read them out in a second. Um, I just wanted to mention, actually, uh, Willona's got her website on there and actually some really great blogs um, as things come out from the government um, well on your updating uh, and you're putting out a new blog post in the next couple of weeks as well so it's quite useful if you want to jot that down um, and have a look over on her website at the blogs there um, no I think it's uh, you mentioned some some good resources there I'd say another one would be uh, exceptional individuals if you're struggling to fill out um, job application forms or you're looking for a a different type of job or changing careers they are a london-based company charity that support as well so um i can drop that in the chat in a minute the name of that um uh, what else was i was thinking the let's start with with some of these questions now so we start at the first one um Bear in mind, we will do our best to answer these questions. Some of them, if they're a little bit more of a legal nature, then by all means, what I can do is you can drop them to me privately in the chat and I can uh, find out the answers afterwards. But uh, let's start with Esther's question. Thank you, Esther. So it has been 10 years since the enactment of the Equality Act 2010. Do you think it's fit for purpose, Wilona? Wow. <laughs> what a question. I my glasses off. <laughs> um, I think the principle of it is a really good one. Um, from what I know is that Act brought together various pieces of legislation relating to discrimination. So the Race Relations Act was in there, the Disability Act was in there. So just brought it all in one and it covers all the different sort of what they call protected characteristics such as disability, gender, sex, religion, etc. In terms of whether it's fit for purpose, I really can't answer that. What I'm, what, from a sort of HR standpoint, I think it's good in a way because it highlights the importance of treating people fairly. So um, the starting point for most employers, most reasonable and sort of responsible employers is that, you know, are we acting within the remit of the law? Are we complying with legislation? So without that piece of legislation, I think a lot of people would be disadvantaged. Well, I guess 10 years is a long time, so it's up to the government, it's up to the law, lawmakers to review and see whether it is fit for purpose in 2020. Especially now that we're moving, you know, so much has happened with COVID. We're all thinking about what the world would look like, what the working environment would look like, post-COVID. So this might be the right time to review that piece of legislation, but I guess the government might have quite a lot on their hands right now, and that might be the last thing they'll be looking at. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you, Ilona. So um, Matthew's got a question here. For the self-employed, some of whom work in a regular workplace, much like an employee would, are there any government grants, support and advice to help them in their workplace or with support for their business? Now, I don't know if I can help with this answer because actually, as of the beginning of May, um, the government has put out uh, some support for the self-employed and I can put the links to that into the chat. Um, basically, there's a uh, self-employed income support scheme 
So you have to go through a process and see if you're eligible. So I can, I can post the link up to of that so that you can go through the process and see if you're eligible. And if you have any problems going through the process, it's a government website. So actually you can ring them up and speak to them and explain that you're dyslexic and that you're struggling to fill out the uh, form online if there's any problems with that. I don't know, Wilona, if you wanted to add anything else to that particular question. Yeah, sure. In terms of the self-employed, I think they could also reach out to Business Link or even ACAS. Um, you know, ACAS is a sort of website that deals with sort of employment at work issues. And the person sort of mentioned that, so I can't remember who, who it was, but that they work, they're self-employed, but they're working as an employee. So if you're Matthew, actually yeah. working, at Matthew, yes. Yeah. So Matthew, if you're working as an employee, then that person that you're working for I'm not sure what the arrangement is but they should really ensure that they should treat you like they would um anyone that's working at their in their premises should have you know the right access the right things that they need to carry out their role but I would imagine I would imagine I would really urge you to get specific advice on that yeah thank you Wilona I hope that answers the question Matthew um Great. So we have another quick, we've got quite a few questions. So thanks everyone. Um, Emma has mentioned, um, how do I approach and arrange a constructive return to work in the absence of my union rep? There is a moratorium on my case due to COVID-19. There have been little understanding so far and I am anxious about returning, especially due to the current situation we are in. So I would imagine, see, I would imagine if, um, so what is, I wonder what the situation is with the union rep, because if a particular union rep is not available, the union should be able to find somebody else that should help. So I would contact the union itself and get some advice and see if they can allocate somebody else to support my case. I mean, it's something where in terms of a, a return to work, you should be speaking directly to your employer, but it sounds as though so there's some underlying issues and stuff going on already. So I would speak to the union and ask them to find somebody else to support me. I hope that helps. Thank you, Alona. Um, I mean, I will say now, and I'll, I'll mention it again at the end, if there's any questions or anything you're not clear of, um, by all means, um, drop us an email info at dyslexialondon.org again I will put that in the chat and it will also be on the email you will receive with all the slides and and um, this recording on as well so if there's anything Wilona has kindly said that any other questions um, she can help with after the, this webinar she will do so thanks Wilona so great um, let's move on to to the next question now um, what would you advise when you work for an employer who does not feel it is their ethical responsibility to support dyslexic employees. I have a dyslexic colleague who's working 13 hours a day, seven days a week to manage their workload. She has spoken to her line manager and been told she is employed to complete her work. She is heading for a breakdown, but to challenge her employer would mean she as a lone person would have to go up against the, an entire HR department, her manager, and an institution. She is already exhausted and her self-esteem is low. How could she do this? Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's a really sad state of affairs. I would contact the HR team again and I would say I am going to be seeking legal advice on this. I mean, I know it's tough. I know it's hard, but there is support out there and I don't think anyone should be going through that. I mean, any HR department, knowing that they need to support somebody and the person's now on the verge of seeking legal advice, um, that would make people think. So um, I would advise them to, again, reach out to HR and also try and document every single thing. So if you're not able to speak to them, as in verbally, as in we can't even, you can actually email and keep records of those email. Write a letter, um, email, and, uh, email them saying how distressed you are, saying how difficult things are, you know, given the timeline, how long you've been suffering for. Just give everything in that email and say, right, you're at the point now where 
it's affecting your health, you're a lone parent, just say it as it is. And then email them and see what happens. As long as you have to have that in writing, it's, it has to be a process that has to be followed, unfortunately. I know that it's tough. We don't want to have to start going through a tribunal or we don't want to start contacting lawyers, but that situation really should not be happening. It shouldn't continue. So um, I would start writing to them, keeping a record of that conversation, of that email. And then if they don't do anything about it, I will be phoning ACAS to get advice. And once I've phoned ACAS, I would tell them that I've contacted ACAS. I mean, if you are then dismissed as a result of that, that is an issue. But then so they right could, now, I'll be, I'll right sorry, now, I'll be seeking legal advice. Sorry, I, I was saying. So, if they were dismissed at because of that, then that would be a point where they could speak to a lawyer. Because of course, because yeah. then you're being dismissed because of your disability or because you have um, expressed something that is affecting your health. So, um, you're really in a strong position to be seeking legal advice. And the thing is, I know that sometimes people are a bit reluctant to do, make that first step, but it's a whole weight and it's a whole burden on you. You find that the minute you've opened up and spoken to somebody outside, somebody independent, they've reassured you, they've told you what you need to do, you're going to feel a lot better. You're going to sleep a bit better. So rather than keeping it all in and being afraid, you don't have to suffer like that. So there's help out there. Seek that help. The minute you make that one phone call and start putting things in place, you are going to feel a lot better than not doing anything about it. Yeah, I, I mean, we understand. I'm personally, I'm dyslexic, and it's really difficult when you're very stressed to deal with yeah. a situation like that. So it really, yeah. for me, it exasperates all of my dyslexia. So, um, yeah, I really feel for for that person and what they're going through there. Yeah. Thank you. Or maybe the they can get someone to support them, get someone to help them to do it. So they don't have to even write that email by themselves. Maybe a family member or somebody that they could reach out to. I mean, there's yeah. lots of um, some free helplines out there. I mean, I could probably help to look for some helplines that you can phone that are free. That can at least just even having somebody at the end of the phone that you could speak to you that will reassure you and give you some support that is a lot that helps a lot thank you Alana. um going back to the emma who mentioned about the union rep um apparently um she's mentioned that they're not taking they've put a stop on cases right now so that, oh, i wow. guess that's the issue yeah so i'm not sure so does she that. not I guess then if there's the unions not, I'm not, I really don't be able to, um, it sounds like there's a legal case already and stuff going on with the union. So unfortunately I won't be able to advise on that specific case. Perhaps she could email and give the full facts of the case and we can take it from there. But without yeah. knowing the whole picture, because the fact that you're saying there's a union involved, there's moratorium on it, it sounds like that something has been happening already. So I won't be able to advise on that right now. No, that's fair enough. Yeah, I've just put I've just put our email address into the chat box. So Emma, please please drop us an please, email. Emma. Yeah, please do drop us a line, and yeah, we'd like to help. Thank you. Um, so next question: um, What adjustments can be made for timed questions recorded online, part of a job pre-interview process? I found these quite stressful and unable to produce and organize a cohesive or cohesive answers in two to three minutes that were given to record each answer. There was no option of re-recording answers. Can this way of recruitment be challenged? So before, before online, I'm assuming this is an online um, test that they're being asked to do and each question is two to three minutes and mm -hmm. it's, a, and they, and they're dyslexic and there's no extra time being given. What can they do? Did, I wonder whether they actually did were they informed that you're dyslexic and you need extra time. Because you should definitely let them know, like I said in the in the slides, that um you should let them know what sort of adjustments you're gonna need um as part of the assessment process. So that needs we need to find out whether they knew about that. 
Okay. Well, um, by all means, um, you can write in the Q and A or in the in the chat box, um, and um, let us know if that's the case. Because I guess if they if they did know about that and they haven't changed it, then that's also kind of a legal that's requirement. A, that's to change a, yeah, exact, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, next question. Yep. Yeah, oh, I've, we've got a question about uh, getting a copy of the content to read through on. Off, offline absolutely that will be, be available and you'll get an email with a link to everything that you've seen today and you also have our email address if you have any problems or don't receive that email so jot that down and uh, you should get an email um, early next week with everything on so just to let you know thank you um, then we have Margaret um, if I'm not diagnosed where should I go to get this done um, well I might I'll start answering this one basically it, it really depends um, where you are in your life. For example, if you're a, a student there at university, uh, you can speak to a disability officer and they can organise an assessment for you. And, and even if you're a school or college, sometimes you can get funded for that. Um, university generally, they fund that. Um, if you're an adult and you have a, psych a psychologist assess you, there are... Um, various people that you can go to for an assessment there's also some free sort of assessments online uh, legally you don't have to show any proof of your dyslexia to an employer um, they can ask that you you take an assessment and they can pay offer to pay for it they can be quite pricey uh, from about 300 pounds upwards if you if you have the assessment with a full psychologist there are some other options um, what we'll do is um, I'll drop you a message with a place where you can look to see uh, a list of assessors, uh, Margaret, and uh, I'll put that in the email on next week. So you can see a link to various assessors so that you can choose which would be more appropriate for you or if you want to do the free, on free online test. I hope that answers that question for you. Um, moving on. Dwayne says, how can you get an employer to focus on your strengths rather than challenges? Um, yeah. I think you should have a conversation with them about how you're feeling and highlight your strengths to them yourself and challenge that, you know, we're not all perfect. We all have strengths and we all have areas um to, to, for development so what are you doing to help me with my weaknesses or my areas that i need to develop so that's a conversation that needs to be had with that employer i guess it's about being assertive and a lot of people feel it's a difficult conversation to be had sometimes to sort of stand up for what you believe in you're at work you know this is your livelihood you're trying to think, you know, do I say this or not? Is this a career limiting exercise? But there are lots of good employers out there. And like I said earlier, that people are trying to be inclusive. So sometimes you'd be surprised that just having that conversation might change things. Yeah, thank you. I think, I think it is um, sometimes we as dyslexics expect employers to understand fully the process and what to do for us and actually the case is unfortunately that a lot of them haven't got a clue um when you've got someone in hr like Willorna, then it's great because they un you understand the process and you can help and aid with that but unfortunately even some hr professionals really don't know how to deal with the situation properly and so what we encourage and and even if you think that shouldn't be the case which it shouldn't we really do encourage everyone um, in our support groups to empower themselves and part of that is to understand your own strengths and weaknesses and be able to almost sell them to an employer and 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 also I mean, I know it's easier said than done, but it is really important to work for someone that values you because otherwise it's going to ground you down. And so where possible, um, there's, in the last few years, it's really changing with employers and Microsoft are seeking people who are dyslexic. Some of the consultancies are seeking people who are dyslexic. And so it's really great to work for organizations that will um, embrace you and support you um, rather than you be fighting them all the time. You know, the amount yeah. of people that 
come to the support group and they're in admin roles that they're, you know, they're not so good at. And they're so brilliant, you know, brilliant ideas, people, brilliant strategic minds. And I know, again, it is easier said than done, but it's, it's about, um, it's so sad. It makes me really angry because really uh, there's so many talented people that are in the wrong job, really. Um, yeah, exactly. So um, I'm coming from my sort of education background as a teacher. I'm still very, very passionate about helping people and empowering people and making people get the best out of themselves and their talent. So I would say even when you're looking for a role, choose your battles. Look at this employer very well. Look at their reviews on Glassdoor or whatever. Make sure that this is going to be the right place for you. Even when you attend the interview, it's a two-way conversation. It's not just about them interviewing you. Ask some questions about how do you support people? What's it like to work around here? What's your culture like? Then you can glean whether that's a supportive employer, whether it's a nice place to work. Because at the end of the day, we spend so much time at work. We spend a whole day and our whole lives at work. So we need to be happy. And especially if you're sort of, you feel you've got a condition that um, hinders you, you need to be supported. You need something, someone to really build up your self-esteem and your confidence. You don't need to be in a place where they're constantly pulling you down. I know it's easier said than done, like Philip has said, but if you're right now, you're looking for a new role, I would give this piece of advice that make sure, try and find, and there are lots of good employers out there now. There are lots of startups, some smaller um, companies that are looking for bright, talented people who think out of the box. They're not looking for the traditional people. They're looking for people who are imaginative, creative. And I know that dyslexia lends to all of those qualities. So yeah, I would urge people to really have that confidence. And this is the time, this opportunity to just pivot yourself for a role with an employer that is going to value you as a person. Great points, Lorna. And and Daniela's joined in and said um, they do not always understand. It's about teaching them new ways how people work well with dyslexia. And it starts with yourself understanding who you are and what you can give to the world. Now, that's so true. Thank you. That's so nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. really lovely. Um, I also, jumping back to the, uh, the person who uh, sent the question about the online exam, um, they told them before the exam that they were dyslexic and was told on the on that day that they did not have they didn't have the support for for that and they would would not be accommodated but they were given the choice to reapply wow yeah wow okay um we need to take that offline <laughs> if they yeah. can email in I, I wouldn't, <laughs> if they can email in and we'll take that offline. Yeah, yeah, because I think that's a legal issue there. But um, okay, thank you. Um, yeah, just drop us, drop us an email. Um, okay, yeah. so um, next question. Um, thanks, Lord. We've got quite a few, but we've still, we've still got time. So um, to see the participation. <laughs> yeah, no, board, really great. We have on board people. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's really great. Thanks, everyone, for your question. So um, how do we go about the recruitment process when it is a recorded interview and it is time restricted? I think that's similar sort of to the last, last yeah. one, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Um, I think, it, again, it's, it's... It seems like there are lots of issues. It seems like it's really disappointing that it seems like people are not getting the support that, that they need. It seems like not all employers are aware of their responsibilities to support people. Or maybe these are small employers that maybe don't have HR or don't know or don't know about the law. And that's actually quite disheartening. Mm. Yeah, and I think um, Adenike has mentioned uh, that the question affects a lot of graduates with dyslexia and I think one of the issues we have is that that actually at university quite a few of them are really supportive with dyslexia and what we find in the support group is people going to the world of work and you know where they've had uh, disability um, 
officers at university and they've been fully supported they're now in the world of work and there's no support and it's it's really difficult anyway making that transition from being a graduate into the world of work let alone to then have dyslexia and then suddenly realize that, that there's a lot less support for you um i mean it's quite, i think it's quite... i think I've, got, I've just had a thought now because i'm a member of the cipd which is the um professional body for hr practitioners i wasn't aware that people were struggling like this until obviously you've asked me to come and give this talk and now judging from some of the questions that have come in there seems to be a lack it seems as though people are not getting the support so I'm actually willing to take this to the CIPD it's a topic for HR professionals to be aware of I think that might be one thing that we could do um, I could work with you Philippa with Dyslex Dyslexia London to see what we could do to highlight this to the CIPD, because as the people profession, that is what we stand for to, um, to support people at work. A better working world is really one of our sort of mantras. So um, I'd like to take this up, because I'm also a member of the CIPD and I've actually sat on a, a committee, a branch committee. And there's also, we've got a piece around diversity and inclusion. So I definitely will be bringing this up now that I've seen these questions. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, Beth says thank you, Alona. That's amazing. And uh, I mean, thank you from all of us. I, I think maybe the issue is that there's the wonderful people out there like you and they don't realise that there's, there's some others that aren't so wonderful. Um, so um, thanks. I, I'll, I'll thank you for that. That would be great. We can work together and see what we can do. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So um, the next question, due to the economical situation with unemployment increasing in the UK, how will, for example, people with dyslexia like myself impact the job market in the future as the processes of getting into a role is quite lengthy and pressured? Yeah, that, I mean, just like anything else right now, most people are going to struggle. There are going to be a bit of struggles, but basically focus on your strengths. My advice would be to focus on your strengths Look at roles that, if you're unemployed at the moment, look at roles that will play to your strength. Look at employers, perhaps look at their website. They probably will say something about how they support people, doing the recruitment process, etc. And focus yourself on those employers that you know are going to support you. But don't think too much about your weaknesses. Focus on your strengths. Because I'm sure... I mean, out of this, every challenge is an opportunity. There are going to be some opportunities coming out of this, regardless of your condition. Great, thank you. Julie says, do you think we should change the language around dyslexia? For instance, avoid saying someone is suffering from or has been diagnosed with dyslexia. For instance, we should see dyslexia as a different way of processing information rather than a problem with processing information. Um, I completely agree with you, Julie. I think yeah. it would be ama it would be amazing to get to that point. I think the yeah. difficulty at the moment is um, that having it having it classed as a disability means that there is there is supposed to be obviously we're seeing there isn't there's supposed to be extra support there, which is what's needed now. Living in mm. what I call a, bit of a linear world, still, I think it's changing, and in the future that would be the utopia. Um, I guess for now in terms of being able to have that that kind of extra support is really important but yes we mm. we should start to change the lexicon around around dyslexia yeah, mm. yeah it'd be good to change the narrative to make it to show the positive so for example yeah. when i give those examples of famous people i didn't know that jimmy oliver or george washington was dyslexic so a lot of people think it's to do with reading and writing they don't think, you know, I think perhaps the, the language, maybe even the way you guys promote it as part of your association, it's to, to review how it's, it's sort of put out there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's a bit of, a, it's a, bit of a, a long question here, I guess, in terms of, uh, of the answer. But Antonia says, what evidence do you need to raise a discrimi discrimination grievance case? I don't know Remember when, yeah, so um, when I was talking about the lady who, whose colleague was struggling and I said it's always good to have, to write the email, etc, etc. 
the evidence will be a written piece. So maybe record incidents, record stuff, emails, keep all of that. Because if you're going to go to um, a tribunal, or even if it's not a tribunal, it's an internal grievance, they have to do an investigation. And the evidence will be talking to people, will be written records, will be meeting notes and things like that. So um, it's always good to keep those records. So that's where your evidence needs to start. So for example, you're not happy about something, you've spoken to your manager, they've not done anything about it. You go back to your, your laptop, your desk, you send an email. We had this conversation today. I expressed X, Y, and Z. You weren't helpful. I'm not happy, et cetera, et cetera. I hope I could get a bit more support. I know it takes a lot of boldness and bravery to do that, but we can't be allowing people to get away with stuff. Yeah. yeah yeah no absolutely um cb's mentioned um it will be useful if access to work followed the employee rather than having to go through the process each time you change jobs i completely agree it's yeah. really it's a really long process and it's really difficult and and it's not particularly helpful um but i'm 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 grateful that we've got some support but yeah it is i completely agree with you there thank you um I think, what's the next one? Oh, some of you, sorry, remember I'm dyslexic and some of you've answered the que answer questions or commented as well. So I'm looking for the next, I'm looking for the next question. Here we go. Um, are there any training courses to increase assertis assertiveness for dyslexics? That's, a, that's for you, Philippa. Do you know of any? No, do you know what? I don't. Um, I know you do some coaching. Um, so I think if it's within a job, job role, um, I imagine that that sort of thing would would really help it's good for us to yeah. have a think about this because i yeah. i think it's actually very much needed so thank you for mentioning it yeah. we'll have a look at if there's something we can do in the future to help support yeah. people with that yeah. um and i'll definitely yeah. have a look have a look into that um so thanks jalpa um Next question. I'm due to set a virtual interview for a role in the police service over Zoom. What measures can I ask to be put in place to give me the best chance of succeeding? What, what would you normally struggle with if you were going to use? So basically, I would think that you have to think about what you need, what you're going to struggle with, what are going to be the barriers um, when you're confronted with that Zoom because I guess it's an individual thing, um, yeah. depending on your condition, and then review that and then ask whether they can put that in place for you. I guess the Metropolitan Police is a large organization. They probably will be able to put some, some things in place, but that would be an individual thing in terms of knowing what you're going to struggle with, what hindrances are there with using Zoom or that type of interview and then ask for that to be put in place. Yeah, I think that's, I think it's difficult to say that, as you say, unless you know, because everybody yeah. who's dyslexic struggles with different- Different, different things, things, yeah. Yeah. Um, and Zoom yeah. is a new world as well. So think about once, I guess you might have attended a few webinars in the last few weeks. Um, Think about how you have reacted to those webinars or think about how you've reacted to any sort of virtual training in the recent weeks and what are your struggles, what are the things that were difficult and then think about an interview scenario. I guess with a virtual interview, it's basically the same as your face-to-face. -face. It's just the only difference is we're on Zoom, you're not seeing the person physically. But think about how you might cope with that or what difficulties you might have and then take it from there. Thank you. And um, I think Julie mentioned, uh, Julie who mentioned about changing the way we, we talk about um, dyslexia, we could attempt to change the environment rather than the individual, which is, which is, is nice. Um, it's a, it's a big job. <laughs> it's a big oh. job, but I think it's really important to empower each person to to talk about dyslexia. If you are dyslexic, it's obviously close to your heart to talk about dyslexia in that way so that then it starts, everybody else will start talking about dyslexia in that way. And um, as Walorna said, I think there's a big gap in, in HR 
managers understanding it and so perhaps we can also work together to to look at that as well yeah. and empower both dyslexics and hr managers and that's the first yeah. step but it is a big job for everyone to change the way we we see dyslexia um well, baby it, steps you have to start somewhere yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> exactly um and someone else says great Thank you. Great job, everyone. Thanks very much for the feedback. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I'm glad it's and, helpful. And Dwayne says, thanks all. Um, next question. We have a few more minutes. So we'll try and get through these last few questions. Um, I'm due to sit a virtual interview. F oh, no, that's the job role one. Hello. Are there any organisations that can advise on employment law in relation to effects on mental health from previous employment burnout? This has affected my mental health till date including recovery from heavy burnout this has affected my ability to return to employment up to a year on oh, oh i'm sorry to that. hear that yeah so this is about previous employment yes this is about previous employment so mm -hmm. you've actually left you've actually left those employers so how long ago did you leave because there's limits as to how long you could bring an employer after you've left how long you could bring a case to a tribunal it's a shame up that to a year on, up to a year on. Uh, so I assume it's been around a year. It's been a year. Then it's probably too late to bring anything to a tribunal. But I would seek. I will call ACAS and seek some legal advice. And I'm really sorry that that person has had to endure that. Um, I hope that you could get some help. Um, maybe forget about those jobs for now and just focus on you. Forget about the. Experience try to not think too much about the painful experiences that you, you endured. Try and focus on yourself, on getting better. Try to seek some counselling. Try to seek some, some help, really. Go and see your GP. Um, ring up the various sort of mental health um, bodies around organisations and support. So I, I'd, I'd, I'd like to think, perhaps, forget. try to forget about those experiences for now and focus on you because it's probably too painful to start thinking about all these employers that have been so horrible just focus on getting better and then in fact when you're in a better place mentally you can take on you can take things on again thanks for Lorna. yeah um Lindsay says, is there any help in the, she's in the New York area, is there any support there? I'm really sorry, Lindsay, because we're based in London. We don't, we don't know the answer to that. Um, oh, I, well, yeah, I did. I'm from New York. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks for joining us today. I hope it's been a, a bit insightful. Um, Dwayne says, I think dyslexia is seen as a childhood disability and therefore when it comes to the workplace, this proves more difficult. Again, completely agree going out of university into the workplace there's not that kind of knowledge there and support in the same way that that people have a university and, and sometimes in schools although that varies depending on where you live but yeah um cb says sadly a dyslexic employee first contact with hr is in a defense of their performance and the HR professional is duty bound to protect the business over the employee. It would be great to have a support role in a, bus in a business for disabled employees in general. I HR think, I think is there to yeah, HR yeah. is there to support the business because I guess the business is there for commercial reason to make money or a charity for their goal, but they also have a duty to support the employee. So um, what was the question again? The first was, so really, um, people should try not to deal with things when it comes to performance. So a lot of, not just HR, a lot of, a lot of line managers do not deal with issues until the performance review. So really what they should be doing is regular conversations, regular check-ins to see that you're doing your role properly and not wait until your performance review before they say there's something wrong. And also, at the start, from the get-go, let them know that you have dyslexia and you need this support. Don't bring it up at the performance review as well. Because they're going to say, they probably think you're making an excuse or what have you. So it's best to just bring it up from day one, from your induction stage, so that everyone knows and everyone's on the same page. 
Um, thank you, Lorna. Going back to um, the person that said about the um, that that they'd been they'd had the problem a year ago with the work, the company. Um, they've said I stated on forms previously to start that I have dyslexia and anxiety. I could not have done any more to help the firm support me. The contract I worked on should have two people in my role from the beginning. This is why I ended up badly burnt out and taking sickness absence. I raised a formal grievance just before leaving. Um, it may be maybe one we could take offline, Willorna, because it seems like there's yeah. quite a lot of yeah. Yeah. It's so if you want there. to drop us a, I'm just going to drop us an email email address to you um uh, teresa says you joined a bit late that's fine don't worry if you've got um we'll be sending out all the slides and a recording so um anything you missed at the beginning you will get so don't worry about that teresa and our email address is also in the chat so if you don't receive it early next week by all means drop us an email and we'll send it to you cb says good advice thank you very much cb uh, we've just got the last oh. few questions. We're running a little bit over time, but um, we'll, we'll answer these last few questions. So thank you. Uh, Roz says, do I have any rights? Do I have any rights to ask for dyslexia friendly software paid for by my company? Yeah. So Clear Talent and Hands Free Com Computing are two companies that can provide some assessment and advice for you. Clear talent and hands free, and I guess access to work as well. If um, they support the employer with that, yeah. So um, it's the laws changed slightly, so I don't want to um, quote it. But if you tell your employer you're dyslexic um, and you speak to HR, they should know that you can apply for access to work, which will help to fund that software, depending on how yeah. big the company is. Yeah. Um, if you don't tell your employer, then um, they won't put that in place and if they don't put that in place even after you've told them then you can instigate it that that you would like a what's called a workplace assessment and yeah. a workplace assessment would look at uh, strategies where you sit in the office how you're sitting what software yeah. you need so they go through quite a few different different areas so it's really useful to do that yeah absolutely that's it um so francesca says i personally find quite difficult to answer the question about my dyslexia during the application process i feel i can potentially be discriminate at the very beginning of the process discriminated against at the very beginning of the process i'm also new to this problem as i recently became aware of being dyslexic um can we be discriminated against by declaring that we are no you class against the law to be discriminated against because of that and it is the equality act 2010 which i mentioned earlier on you should not suffer any discrimination as a result of being dyslexic. Yeah, I, I mean, I think sometimes it is the case that it happens, but technically... But it's it just very, I can understand the sort of reluctance and the fear that it's just, against even like mental health. I mean, I know we're all trying to encourage people to talk about their mental health at work. It's still a really difficult area. It's not that easy to open up and speak to your line manager at work about how you're feeling but I've just seen an upsurge in people talking about their mental health especially during COVID so I think this could be an area that one of the positives that has come out of this crisis is that people are just being human now and people are just talking about it. I, I mean I'm on LinkedIn and I see lots of posts where people say oh I really struggled today or Things have been really tough. I don't know about anyone else, but I'm struggling with self-isolation. I'm struggling with working from home and having to manage my kids and this and that. So I would imagine that things are going to change going forward where we are going to be a lot more kinder to ourselves and open to have those difficult conversations because it's our mental health, it's our well-being, it's our way of living well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ros says, brilliant. Thank you. Francesca says, thank you. Um, I'm just going to the chat now. We've got the last few questions. Um, my employer believes I might have dyslexia. Once I started to research it, I believe I do struggle with many points. My employer has asked that I get checked out. Which companies do you recommend in London that can assess if I have dyslexia? Okay. What I'll do is we've had a few questions about that. So um, I will drop that in the 
and an email to you all with all the slides on early next week. Um, I can send you that across. Um, hello, are there any organisations that can advise on employment law in relation to effects on mental health from previous employment burnout? I think this is, that is the, the same. That was yeah, the same. so yeah. I think if you if you can drop us an email, then drop us can, an email and yeah. we could see what we could do to support with that. I'm really um, sorry to hear that you've been struggling like yeah. that. Um, Beth says she agrees with Anila. Sadly, legal action can also be very costly and have to be weighed up against the stress that will cause and the difficulties yeah. in then gaining future employment and references. Um, and uh, David mentions what should your employer do in terms of providing adequate software? I think that's answered really in the in the access to work question. Mm -hmm. There should be an assessment. You should have had a workplace assessment and mm -hmm. um, they'll be able to help you understand what software you need because sometimes it's difficult to know what's out there. So there's an expert that will come and help you to, to work out what, what you're struggling with and what software there is and match you up. So it's really important to have that assessment. Um, I didn't mention the health and safety executive because that's the body that oversees health and safety at work. So it might be worth looking at their website as well, especially right now um, when we're talking about going back to work, coming out of lockdown. They've been kind of at the forefront of health and safety at work in terms of what the work environment should look like for people. So I would recommend, I guess we could put that in, in, the, in the links at the end as well. The health and safety executive. Yep. Yep. I've got health and safety site. Okay. I've got that. And we can send that across next week. We'll send any, um, any URLs that we've mentioned of websites to, to go to across at the end. And then we'll also look to try and put this on our website um, over the coming month or so to, to make mm -hmm. it clearer and easier for people to get this information. Now we know what you're looking for. So, um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna answer kind of two more questions. So sorry, because there are a few questions that I haven't been able to answer, but they they're still um but we're all, almost ten minutes over time. So um if I haven't answered your question, I'm really sorry and if Lorna hasn't answered, so can you drop us an email and, and we will do our best to answer after the call because I'm conscious that we've been going for quite a while now. So um <laughs> final final question would be um I've just resigned from a well being mental health charity and I'm recently unemployed I felt like I had no alternative to leave as I've battled with them because they have tried to get rid of me in many ways and the last one was that they performance managed me because I refused and didn't agree with the hiked up targets that were set so I would fail oh that's quite a sad situation oh no yeah and that was a mental health organization yeah Wow, so they're not preaching what they, they're not practicing what they preach. Yeah, so as I said, they're now unemployed and in a bit of a pickle. Wow, sorry mm. to hear that. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd speak to exceptional individuals or, or one of the organisations that Willona mentioned earlier because they can look at your strengths and, and, and if you know, you've actually, you have a holding down there. And um, if you've just recently resigned and you resigned as a result of your employer making um, things really difficult for you, I would contact ACAS. So if it's yeah. sort of recent, you, res you resigned recently because um, of a situation that the employer made it really difficult for you to be at that place, I would contact ACAS and get some legal advice. Again, we could put the ACAS... Um, the ACAS website details are on your links, Philippa. Because it yeah. seems as though yeah, we'll people, need, as well. people need some serious legal advice. Yeah, yeah, we'll do that. No, thank you. Um, I've got on a positive note, after working with an organisation for about five years, I approached my managers and they're paying for 15 sessions of dyslexic counselling with groups. I had to do the research and educated them, but they came through with their support. That is fantastic news, Mark. Thank you so much for sharing. Groups That's really nice and positive. <laughs> yeah, groups is um, a counselling charity um, based in London, but they train dyslexic counsellors across the UK. It's run by Penny Aston, who was on one of our previous webinars. It's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. So if you're looking for counselling, I recommend going to that website. We can also um, 
We could also That's include that. Thanks for sharing that. We can share yeah. that as well. Yeah. I'm really, really sorry to those of you that we haven't um, haven't answered your questions. I, th I hope we've answered most of them. Um, I really appreciate everyone joining us today. Um, I was excited to see so many of you and glad that... Uh, thank you so much, Willorna, for, for coming along. And My really pleasure. I'm really glad to help. And as I say, um, try and reach out by email and we'll have to look into this business of people not being supportive because I don't think it's fair for people to be struggling like that. Absolutely. Um, we will send also send a link to you um, to sign up for our newsletter. Please sign up for our newsletter. It does support the charity, but also when we start to put initiatives in place, um, like Wilona and I um, will get together and see what we can do and we'll put an update on those um, newsletters as well. So um, if you can, we won't spam you. It's all very relevant information. And um, if you want to get in contact with Wilona, feel free to contact her through her website or drop us an email and we'll pass your email across. So thank you once again and, um, and have a wonderful weekend, everybody. Yes, thank you. Have, stay well and stay safe, everybody. <laughs> thank you. Thanks very much.